Welcome back. You're watching to the point. Shushma Swaraj spent the weekend meeting Indian ambassadors from the Middle East as well as Gulf ambassadors to India. This was part of an elaborate set of arrangements to secure the 10,000 Indians in Iraq and if need be facilitate their speedy evacuation. So what exactly is the situation Indians face in that embattled country? And how adequate is the government's response? My guests are India's former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Oman and the United Arab Emirates, Talmiz Ahmed. India's former ambassador to Iran, KC Singh. Former Deputy National Security Advisor Leela Ponapa, and joining us from Kirkuk in Iraq, the Strategic Affairs Editor of the Hindu, Praveen Swami. Praveen Swami, you are speaking to us from Kirkuk. Let me start with three quick questions about the situation facing Indians in Iraq. First of all, what is the latest about the 39 workers held in captivity? The, the simple uh, truth is nobody has any coherent idea. Uh, local residents I spoke to yesterday, refugees leaving Mosul, said they'd seen expat workers helping uh, the Islamist insurgents dig earthworks and dig. Uh, but we have no idea if the 39 Indians are among them or not among them. Uh, understanding is also that uh, oh. of communication trying to get through haven't succeeded so far. So that suggests that, in fact, A, they are safe, and B, if I've understood you correctly, though the line was breaking up, they may even be working alongside some of the Islamist insurgents who've allegedly taken them captive. Have I understood that correctly? Yes, that is possible. As I said, local people saying they've seen migrant workers, there are others from Pakistan, Nepal, working on these defensive fortifications. They may have been either press-ganged or paid to work uh, on these fortifications. We really don't know. What about the 46 nurses in Tikrit, a city that is now under siege with the Iraqi army attempting to try and take it back? And we're not exactly sure how much success the army has had. What is the position of these nurses who are apparently holed up in a hospital and possibly caught in the middle of the crossfire? Well, there's intense fighting around Tikrit um, and areas, uh, ISIS uh, instead, uh, facilities near the city have been attacked both by air and by ground. Uh, the nurses, uh, we know, are safe, uh, but there is no escape corridor from the city. Uh, the road heading south from Kirkuk to Baghdad, which skirts around Tikrit, is open. Uh, very little traffic on it, but it's open. However, there's no routes uh, uh, in and out of the city, and the nurses basically and unfortunately just have to sit it out. We have to hope and pray for the best. Now, when the nurses were last reported on in the Indian press, it was still being said that they were reluctant to leave, they wanted to stay on, they had money that was owed to them, and despite the danger of their position, they preferred staying on. Is that still believed to be their position, or are they now of a different mood and willing and wanting to leave? At the last they were spoken to, they, they, they seemed inclined to uh, buckle down and stay. They seemed uh, reassured by uh, assurances. They'd locally received that they would be safe, uh, but everyone who can is getting out of the war zone. Uh, Kirkuk today, I was told by local authorities that more than a thousand families uh, from different parts of uh, the, the stretch from Tikrit to Mosul uh, had arrived seeking refuge. Uh, so I, I must say they're gritty people. If, uh, and having said that, uh, by now it's simply too late to safely get out unless they're willing to run extraordinary risks. Uh, the best thing they can possibly do is stay there and wait it out. The best they can do is stay there and wait it out. Trying to get out would be too risky. Have I understood that correctly? That is correct. One last question before I go to all my other guests. What about the situation facing the 10,000 other Indian people in Iraq who are not necessarily either in conflict or in danger zones? What is the situation they confront? The bulk of Indians uh, working in Iraq are in the autonomous region of Kurdistan, where they're absolutely safe. It's the one stable and functional part of the country. I spoke to very many Indians in uh, the, the, the cities of Kirkuk and Erbil, and uh, they were absolutely clear they had no intention of leaving. Uh, the Kurdish uh, 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 government has proved very good at securing its regional borders and making sure nothing happens within. Uh, similarly, to the south of Baghdad, heading towards Basra, another major uh, area where Indians work, the situation remains peaceful. Uh, the Iraqi army seems to have halted ISIS's southward advance. Uh, and now it basically seems that the stretch from Baghdad to, uh, uh, to, to Mosul in the north 
is where the fighting is going to be, that front line sort of stabilizing. So Indians in the two major sort of uh, concentrations of Indians uh, seem relatively safe. And as you said a moment ago, those that you've spoken to show no intention whatsoever of wanting to leave. Did I understand that correctly? Absolutely right, Karan. In fact, at a hotel I was staying at, I asked many Indians why they didn't leave. They said the situation is peaceful, the salaries are twice those they would get in Dubai or uh, Saudi Arabia. They saw absolutely no reason to head home. Talmiz Ahmed, in the last 24 or 36 hours, ISIL has converted itself into an Islamic state. They've declared a caliphate. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has been made the new caliph. Will these developments have any impact on the security and safety of Indians in Iraq, and in particular those Indians in areas now ISIL-controlled? I think this is a very serious development. This is the first time that a major uh, swath of territory has come under jihadi control after the Taliban had occupied Afghanistan. This is going to have significant repercussions all across Iraq and also all across the region. As far as uh, the safety of our people is concerned, I think the situation has got just a little worse because there is going to be actual military confrontation. Up to now, till a few, few days ago, they were under occupation. But now that the Iraqi army seems to have mobilized and has started fighting, uh, now initially at the Creed, and later on possibly there will be advances, there will be also air force attacks. I think that they will be, uh, there will be a certain degree of insecurity that has got enhanced. Now, Casey Singh, you've heard Talmiz Ahmed analyze that he believes the situation has deteriorated slightly and could get considerably worse as the Iraqi army now tries to push back into areas that it's lost. The government has clearly begun to take steps to either protect or to facilitate the exit of Indians. It set up three camp offices in Najaf, Karbala and Basra. INS Mysore, INS Tarkash are on standby. IAF C-130 J aircraft as well as some supposedly Air India planes are similarly on standby. As someone who has experience of this from inside the MEA, do you believe the government response is adequate? Uh, it may be a little, it may be a little excessive if anything because a ship is required when you have thousands of people and the airports are not open. So that is more like a standby thing. Uh, otherwise what, what is a ship going to do? In any case, Iraq doesn't really have a port. You'll have to bring them to Kuwait or bring them there. Uh, so this is really more for optics. I think government is showing, they're doing everything. Uh, Really what you require is airlift and you have the aircraft for that and at a short notice you can send the aircraft. Now essentially three things are happening. You have a conflict zone which is controlled by ISIS or ISIL. You've got the Kurdish autonomous region uh, where obviously for the time being people are safe because the Kurds are holding the line. And you've got the rest of uh, Shia Iraq where for the time being the lines are being held. So essentially I think the problem is the conflict zone, which, is, which would be essentially uh, Tikris and uh, okay. uh, Kittik, uh, tic, uh, essentially Mosul and uh, Tikri. Now, those are the two places and you've got small numbers of Indians there. Hopefully, there are no more. There may yet be some more Indians in that area that we are not aware of. Now, you've heard uh, Leela Purnapa, KC Singh describe the, the response of the government as possibly a little excessive. On the other hand, Manish Tiwari, the former Minister of Information and Broadcasting writing in the Asian Age over the weekend accused the government of inertia in rescuing Indians trapped in Iraq. Would you agree with his criticism or do you think that just polemics and politics? It's very clearly politics no, I because I don't believe uh, Mr. Tewari has said uh, what uh, he would have done in this situation. I think Casey has very clearly expounded it. There are three categories of people and our current immediate concern is necessarily those who are caught in the conflict zone. The majority of those in the rest of Iraq, which is peaceful, do not wish to leave. I understand these facilitation units that have branched, uh, branched out to uh, Najaf, Karbala and uh, Basra have identified some 600 plus people who said they did wish 
wish to return and uh, that is being facilitated by commercial airlines they are help, being helped with their uh, okay. ticketing wherever necessary and they are free to leave but the rest want to stay and there is no way the government of India can force them out. The people Praveen Swami of real concern are those that are trapped or caught in ISIS controlled territory where as you heard Talmiz Ahmed say a moment ago the Iraqi army is now determined to push back and recapture and in a sense these are the people who could be caught in the middle of crossfire which is why their position is deteriorating. Do we have an accurate idea of how many such Indians there are? The papers here in Delhi sometimes put the figure at 100 reduced by those who left sometimes they put it at 150 reduced by those who left but you're there do you have a better idea of how many we're talking of? Uh, the truth is, Karan, that uh, nobody knows. Uh, authorities in Kurdistan don't know for certain. Uh, the Iraqi government has other things on its mind right now. Uh, what we do know is uh, that uh, the, the numbers that float around in the local media and local government for all South Asians, that's Indians, Pakistanis, Nepalis, and Bangladeshis, of whom there's a very large number, range from several hundred to several thousand. Many of those uh, are illegal immigrants to the region from elsewhere in the Persian Gulf. So there's, there's no documentation uh, wholly credible of, of the numbers there. It's a bit of a mess, to be quite honest. Uh, the upside, if there is one, is that Mosul, despite the terrible fuel shortages it is facing, uh, from uh, every refugee I spoke to yesterday in day before, uh, seems to be stable and well-governed. There have been no random killings. And while uh, ISIS has conducted terrible brutalities on the Shia minority, it hasn't yet, uh, does not yet seem to have targeted any other kind of foreigner. There's been no talk of threat or danger to uh, South Asian immigrants in the area. And I guess if there's any hope, uh, it, is, it is this, uh, that these people are seen as neutrals, as it were, uh, rather than people uh, on one side or the other of a conflict. Tell me, Samad. You know this part of the world. You've been ambassador in several countries around Iraq, although not in Iraq itself. Can we diplomatically establish contact with either the Sunni tribes in this area or with former officials of Saddam Hussein's army, many of whom are fighting alongside ISIL? Can we possibly even establish some sort of contact with ISIL itself to get to know about those 39 of workers who are held in captivity? I think that is going to be quite difficult. The last occasion when we had such negotiations, the interlocutor had come from their side, representing most probably the tribal elements who had kidnapped our drivers. Uh, unless, an, unless an interlocutor comes forward, you are not going to be able to carry a dialogue forward. Now, at the moment, you have a war situation. You have a country struggling for its survival. You have a beleaguered government which is under extraordinary international pressure and domestic pressure as well. It has become a factor in the regional politics. And you have an extremely motivated, extremely violent, uh, you know, uh, extremely violent jihadi entity who show no mercy to any enemies of theirs and who have a sense of messianic mission that they will not dilute and compromise. I think we should we should accept that this is a dangerous situation. I am not sure that it's going, to, it's going to be easy. We have some outstanding officers who are already placed in Baghdad. Okay. And if there is any opening available, I'm sure that our ambassador and his colleagues will be able to find it. You know, Casey Singh, I hear the note of confidence right at the end of what Talmiz Ahmed said, but the opposite is this. We keep being told by the Ministry of External Affairs that they've got information that the 39 workers are safe, but they remain in custody. But we have no idea officially where they are. Maybe the MEA does. There's been no interlocutor, as Talmiz Ahmed has pointed out, who's come forward. There have been no demands for ransom or any other demand that's made. Do you get the feeling that actually we don't know very much about the position of these 39? And given that they are largely Sikhs from Punjab, is there a sense of concern about them that maybe if there is to be some sort of sectarian attack, they could become focuses of it? Is there cause for concern? Well, there must always be cause for concern because, and this is what I said when we had uh, a discussion on your program last time, uh, because the history of ISIS is of brutality, uh, but at the moment they seem quite uh, content with the money they have taken from the banks in Mosul, and they are also uh, encountering the problem of uh, administering or controlling such a large area. 
because US has done two or three things in the last week or so. They have promised about half a billion dollars, 500 million dollars to other groups in Syria and we've already seen the Syrian free army start taking action against ISIS in Syria. Okay. Uh, we've seen uh, the drones come into play, we've seen the Russians now stepping in. They are transferring some Sukhoi planes which have already been transferred to uh, Iraq. And we've seen the Iraqi army become more forthcoming by attacking Tikrit, uh, para dropping people there and then attacking them. So there is a counterattack which has started and there will be a very brutal counterattack. So caught in this kind of a thing, sometimes you can have a lucky escape because in the confusion you can escape or you can get caught in the crossfire. So we can only keep our fingers crossed. Nobody has any time on the other side at the moment to be negotiating or trading hostages because this is active hostilities. Okay. Now, Leela Ponapa, yesterday, Shushma Swaraj met ambassadors of the Gulf states in India. Can any of them, and I suppose I mean in particular Saudi Arabia and Qatar, exercise influence on ISIL or any of the Sunni tribes supporting ISIL to secure the release, A, of those 39 construction workers in captivity, and B, to help the 46 nurses who seem to be caught up in a hotel in Tikrit and very possibly caught up in the crossfire. Can the Saudis and the Qataris help us? Would they be willing to? I understand the Saudis, the Qataris, really many of the countries in the region were themselves uh, somewhat uh, taken aback by this unexpected course of developments and this very rapid progress of the ISIS. Uh, theoretically, I'm sure they could, but in a war situation where there are open hostilities, both on the ground and possibly by air, I think it's going to be a very dicey situation to expect these countries to make this a priority. Having said that, I think history has shown that whether it's the Red Cross or in this area the Red Crescent has been in a position to act as some kind of an interlocutor. Okay. And uh, I dare say that uh, there are details of uh, the information about the 39 workers, certainly the 46 nurses who were uh, supplied with uh, some money which they said they were short of uh, through the good offices of the Red Crescent. Uh, more than that I think at this stage is not known and it's going to require both patience and uh, detailed skill in terms of time to time operations of what best can be done. Tamiz Ahmed, how well do we as a country get on with the Maliki government in Baghdad? I know that the Maliki government's first priority is in fact their own insurgency which is going to take up all their time and attention. But that apart, do we have influence with them? Do we have a personal rapport with Maliki himself to ensure that perhaps he makes a certain special effort to help the Indians caught in the middle of the crossfire? Prime Minister Maliki has been in power for about eight years and uh, he is a very, very robust, very astute politician. He has excellent ties with India and we have good ties with him. He had visited India uh, some months ago and it was an extremely successful visit. He had talked about Indian companies participating in the various Iraqi projects. Indeed, certain Indian companies have got multi-million dollar projects in Iraq. So we have a very substantial political relationship okay. and, I t and an economic relationship as well. They are the number two supplier of petroleum to us. But this is a very different scenario. There is a political problem because the elections have been held recently and there is no legitimate government that has been formed as yet after the election. The various groups that used to support him from the Shia side earlier, this time appears to be uncomfortable about backing him. Then, of course, you had elements from the Sunni side who used to support him, but we are not sure about their position as of now. This has also become a regional political issue because the Iranians have a certain position. They have been backing him so far and uh, they would like to, as of now, retain him. Though certain voices from Iran have emerged which have suggested that a change of government might be a useful thing. What has happened in the past, frankly speaking, is not very relevant as of now. All right, let me put this to you, Praveen Swami. According to your own paper, The Hindu, the government is apparently taking steps, I mean the Indian government is apparently taking steps to ensure that all Indians working in Iraq are registered so that they can be evacuated at short notice if there is need to do so. Two quick questions. A, do you believe there will be need to evacuate them at short notice or is that unlikely? And B, 
How easy or difficult in these circumstances is it to register all 10,000 Indians? A quick answer to both, please. Uh, frankly, I don't think the resources exist to conduct a mass registration, uh, especially given that some numbers of the Indians are illegal workers uh, here without uh, proper visas, uh, which will complicate, uh, you know, their wanting to make uh, any contact with authority. As for the question of an evacuation, the day may yet come when it's needed. But I should point out that any Indian wanting to leave Iraq today uh, just has to go online and book a ticket. There are many scheduled flights uh, from many airports in the country operating, which will allow people to get back to India. Okay. So finally, I mean, frankly, I find this talk of C-130s and special planes a little uh, silly at this stage. Very quickly, Casey Singh, and time is our enemy, on that first point that you heard from Praveen Swami, that there may be a fair number of Indians in Iraq who are not on proper visas. They will be reluctant to make contact with the embassy. The embassy may not know in turn how to make contact with them. Is there in that predicament a problem that perhaps we don't have an easy solution to? And how large do you think it might be? But you have to give me a very quick answer. No, this is not a problem. We've uh, multiple times from different countries, UAE and so on and so forth, uh, got people out uh, who had visa problems. Not every Indian is uh, always on, on, on a regular visa or a visa for which he had come. This the embassy can take care of and certainly we'll have enough clout with the Maliki government to get over that. And in a war situation, visa is the last thing that is going to be a problem. Or even a travel document, the documents may have been lost or taken away, the embassy will quickly issue duplicates. As someone who was Deputy National Security Advisor under the last government, very quickly, Leela Punapa, do you think this government, the new government, with just a month's experience, is responding adequately and well? A quick answer? Well, I think the total establishment is, it includes the new political leadership, it includes the wide band of officers, not just in Baghdad, but also at all our other embassies, because it's very typical to, to have many of them sent to supplement the uh, manpower at Baghdad in order to deal with this situation. Okay. We have some very fine Arabists in the diplomatic service, Telmis and Case Telmis is a good example. And uh, I think many of our ambassadors know the region well, have the right contracts and will do and are doing the most that can be done in a warlike situation. All right, we're going to have to end this particular discussion there. Clearly, we pray for all the Indians caught in the middle of this difficult situation in Tikrit and Mosul in particular. Hopefully, all will go well. My thanks to all four of my guests for joining me. And in particular, we're very grateful to have Praveen Swami joining us from Kirkuk on what is clearly a difficult moment for him. There we end this particular episode. Goodbye. Good night.